Um, hello, good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's Culture Now. My name is Gregor Muir. I'm a director of the ICA. Um, and I'm delighted uh, to welcome American art theorist Hal Foster and Professor Mignon Nixon, who are here to discuss Hal's new book, Bad New, Bad new Days, Art Criticism Emergency, uh, published this year by Verso, and, and quite timely um, given events here or around this area last night uh, with the Million Mask March. Um, but I, I just outlined briefly for you that Hal Foster is Townsend Martin Professor of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University, a co-editor of October magazine, and, um, uh, and also various books. He's the editor of The Anti-Aesthetic and the author of Design and Crime Recordings, The Return of the Real, Compulsive Beauty, and the Art Architecture Complex. Mignon Nixon is the Professor of Art and Contemporary Art History at the Courtauld Institute of Art. She's the author of Fantastic Reality, Louise Bourgeois, and A Story of Modern Art, and the editor of the Ava Hesse October File. She is a co-editor of October Magazine. I just remind some of us, maybe you want to turn your phones off, just in case you've forgotten. I'd like to thank uh, Verso for uh, their continued collaboration and support. Uh, there will be uh, opportunities for questions at the end, but uh, first of all, I'd like to invite you in, in joining uh, today's speakers. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. Um, I thought I would just say a few things about this book and then maybe read a little bit at the insistence of Mignon. Uh, <clears throat> So this book came about because I began to see a real turn away from the preoccupations of my own generation of artists and critics. Um, I suppose that generation was that of um, postmodernism, at least one version of postmodernism, uh, very taken by ideas that um, the world seemed to devolve into an image and when it didn't devolve into an image, it devolved into a text. I mean, these are the became the cliches of a of a post-structural postmodernism that um, some of us participated in, and October Magazine was associated with. Anyway, um, by the late 1980s, there was a turn away with from uh, this preoccupation. In part, I think, because we began to feel, as it's easy enough to say now, the first effects of neoliberalism. Uh, more and more, the, the body returned in art, but a particular body it was a damaged body. Um, it seemed to, to come as a figure of a damaged body politic, with the social contract trashed and the AIDS epidemic uh, rampant, among other things. Uh, so the, the, uh, the fascination with sheer image, um, sheer text, maybe it, one could see this as a, the aftermath of pop. That, be, uh, that became a thing of the past in a way. And um, this turn to the damaged body was discussed in, in, in line with abjection. So that's the first term that I offer in this book. There are five terms um, that I propose. None really of my own invention. I think terms are um, collective in the making. But uh, I offer five terms as a way to think about art since 1989, um, which I think is a period of its own. So the first one is abject. Um, the second turn away from postmodernism uh, seemed to me to be a matter of desire to reclaim the historical somehow, but uh, in a particular form, histories that were somehow marginal or lost, stranded. And this I came to see in terms of an archival impulse in a, in a range of artists. Um, so that's the second term I, I take up, archival. Uh, these run back, I think, um, to the early years of the period that I, I take up. The, these. They're not exactly paradigms. I think they're um, points of orientation. Uh, 
the abject and the archival um, merged in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, and they, um, I, I, I took them up in, in essays from that period too. And what appears in the book are revised versions of, of thoughts that I've had, had then. Um, but the other texts are all, all much more um, uh, recent. And the third term I, I offer is mimetic. And that's to do with, with artists who, if you like, take a bad thing and make it worse, uh, who seem to believe that the, the only way to work in our world is uh, to work with the given, which is to say, um, with junk space, as Ram Coolhouse has called it, or the capitalist slot bucket, as um, Thomas Hirshhorn has called it. Um, so they, there, in that chapter, I, I focus on artists who uh, kind of work with the, the given of commodity glut and terroristic politics and the like, and in a way, um, exacerbate them to open up um, spaces that are internal to our order or disorder in the present. In other words, they, they suggest an avant-garde that doesn't imagine an outside, uh, a past or a future that they can somehow tap, but uh, um, they present an avant-garde of imminent critique. And um, in a way, there I, I have in mind artists like Isa Genskin and uh, Rachel Harrison and, and others, uh, and that you know I think that is the center of the book in a way. Um, from there, I, I uh, move on to a term that's quite um, quite common now, and that is the precarious. And there, I think about our practices that seek to highlight uh, social conditions that are precarious, and attempt to uh, make such conditions the very ground of the projects that they propose. And there my, my lead figure is, is Thomas Hirshhorn. Uh, the fifth term is post-critical. It's, it's the only one that has a question mark at the end because I want to argue with um, the idea that we are somehow post-critical. And there I, I take on um, two figures that, who have had an enormous influence um, in the art world and beyond, uh, two philosophers, uh, Jacques Rancière and Bruno Latour, and I um, admire the work that they've done, but I, I think they've had deleterious effects uh, on, on art, and I can say why if anyone's interested um, later. And then it, the, the book ends with a, a, a polemic, really a, a diatribe about the the demand, the desire for the performative, um, the processual, the, the present, you know, in, in galleries and museums today. Why is it that everything um, must be live somehow? Uh, why is it that um, institutions of art think that they need to activate us and animate art <coughs> all the time? And I thought I might read just a little bit because that's the, um, as I say, that's the, the polemical side of things. So I'll just it's it's a, a, ch a chapter of <coughs> just seventeen points. I'll just read extracts from a, a few. <clears throat> One over the last decade. Art museums have restaged many performances and dance, mostly from the 1960s and 1970s. Not quite live, not quite dead. These reenactments have introduced a zombie time into these institutions. Sometimes this hybrid temporality, neither present nor past, takes on a gray tonality, not unlike that of the old photographs on which the reenactments are often based. And like these photos, the events seem both real and unreal, documentary and fictive. Sometimes, too, the spaces that are proposed to uh, present this undead art are imagined as gray. Along with the white cube for painting and sculpture and the black box for projected image art, gray boxes are now envisioned 
to maintain such work in a state of suspended animation. <laughs> Two, this institutionalization can be seen negatively as the recuperation of alternative practices or positively as a recovery of lost events. Like independent film, experimental performance and dance have come to the art museum both for audience exposure and out of economic necessity. Yet this doesn't explain the sudden embrace of live events and in institutions otherwise dedicated to inanimate art. During the recent boom in new museums, Rem Koolhaas remarked that since there is not enough past to go around, its tokens can only rise in value. Today, it seems, there is not enough present to go around. For reasons that are obvious in a hyper-mediated age, it is in great demand too, as is anything that feels like presence. Here, the zombie time of reenacted performances complicates matters, for again, they do not seem quite actual. What is staged is less an historical performance than an image of that performance. The performance appears as a simulation, one destined to produce more images for circulation in the media. Five, let me skip ahead. Given, given these problems, why has the performative returned as an almost automatic good? One reason, along with the promise of presence, is that it seems to open up the work to its audience, to expose its making once and for all. Such transparency was a goal of various avant-gardes, both pre-war and post-war, and nowhere more so than in process art in the 1960s. Like performance, process is back with us too. Yet today as then, this making manifest of materials and actions in the work can render its purpose more opaque to the viewer, not more transparent. Rather than motivate the work, this giving over to materials and actions can make it appear arbitrary. Process can also open up the work to the point of its dispersal, with the result that if anybody experiences any one thing, nobody experiences the same one thing. Without the possibility of concentrated experience or shared debate, our viewing is likely to be casual and quick, without much aesthetic resonance or discursive consequence. Just a couple more. Uh, six, why is the performative so readily embraced? Another reason is that like process, it is said to activate the viewer, especially so when the two are combined, when a process, an action, or a gesture is performed. The assumption is that to leave a work undone is to prompt the viewer to complete it. And yet this attitude can easily become an excuse not to execute fully. A work that appears unfinished hardly ensures that the viewer will be engaged. Indifference is as likely a result. In any case, such informality tends to discourage sustained attention, both aesthetic and critical. We are likely to pass over the work quickly because its maker seems to have done so before us, or because quick effect appears to be all that was intended in the first place. Two further assumptions are no less dubious. The first is that the viewer is somehow passive to begin with, which need not be the case at all. And the second is that a finished work in the traditional sense cannot activate the viewer as effectively, which is also false. In terms of activation, give me a Piet Mondrian over a George Machunis any day. Seven, might it be that the critique of authorship as authority has done its job, even done it too well? When Duchamp insisted on the share of the beholder in the creative act, and Umberto Eco argued for the radicality of the open work in their influential essays of 1957 and 58. And when Foucault questioned the author function, and Bard celebrated the death of the author in their landmark texts of 1967 and 68, they did so to challenge the dominance of two positions above all. The formless idea of the artwork understood as a closed system of significance, and the popular idea of the artist seen as the fount of all meaning. These ideas are hardly dominant today. On the, on the contrary, notions of the indeterminacy of the work as advocated by John Cage in the late 1950s and early 60s, and strategies for the participation of the viewer as pioneered by such movements as neoconcretism and flexus in the same period 
are privileged in art practice and art history alike. Disdain not long ago, they are now prized. That is a good thing, but it is less so if we become oblivious to what motivated the indeterminate and the participatory in the first instance, or blind to how these qualities might be valued in art today, precisely because they are devalued elsewhere in society. The indeterminate reduced by big data, for example, the participatory diminished in democracies overtaken by oligarchies. Nine, activation of the viewer has become an end, not a means. And not enough attention is given to the quality of subjectivity and sociality thus produced. Today, museums cannot seem to leave us alone. They prompt and program us as many of us do our kids. As in the culture at large, communication and connectivity are promoted almost in force for their own sake. This activation helps to validate the museum to overseers and onlookers alike as relevant, vital, or simply busy. Yet more than the viewer, it is the museum that the museum seeks to activate. However, this only confirms the negative image that some of its detractors have long had of the museum, that aesthetic contemplation is boring, and aesthetic uh, historical understanding elitist, that the museum is in fact a mausoleum. Just as the viewer must be deemed passive in order to be activated, so artwork and art mu museum alike must be deemed lifeless so that they can be reanimated. Central to modern discourse on the art museum, this ideology is basic to art history as a humanistic discipline, the mission of which Erwin Panofsky wrote 75 years ago is to enliven what would otherwise remain dead. Here the proper retort in our time comes from a medievalist <coughs> art historian, uh, Amy Knight Powell. This is what she, she says. Neither institution nor individual can restore life to an object that never had it. The promiscuity of the work of art, its return, reiteration, and perpetuation beyond its original moment is the surest sign it never lived. Just one more, 10. Another serious question arises about modes of art that promote participation and process above all. Sometimes a politics is ascribed to such practices on the basis of a shaky analogy between an open artwork in an inclusive society, as though a desultory arrangement of material might evoke a democratic community of people, a non-hierarchical installation predict an egalitarian society, or a de-skilled artwork prefigure and anybody can be an artist world. Not only a complication of authorship, collaboration becomes an anticipation of collectivity, and thus again, an almost automatic good. Yet it, as, even as a strong advocate of this line of thinking as Hans Ulrich Obrist has voiced a reservation here, collaboration is the answer, he has said. What was the question? This is to suggest that collaboration threatens to become autonomous as well as automatic. Collaboration, like activation, is encouraged for its own sake. At the very least, collaboration, especially in the guise of curatorial practice taken up as artistic practice and vice versa can become an alibi for the informal, even formless work that I want to question here. And it goes on in that mode, <laughs> but I'll spare you that. Thank you, Hal. Um, thank you for the book and congratulations on it. I, um, I had a plan for talking with you, but as some of you um, might have realized, I also don't have a lot of voice. So I'm going to jump right to <laughs> um, what I think um, is for me uh, a crux of this book. Um, you deliver some good news in the beginning. The avant-garde is alive and well today. Um, and, uh, and then you proceed to, to demonstrate um, how that is the case. And the arguments for me uh, turn on a really important question which you formulate as uh, what if there are no laws anymore? 
And that is something I, I would um, find very, very interesting in terms of the history of your um, development of thinking on the avant-garde. So if I could um, make this a slightly long-winded first question, is that all right? Um, Apologies for that, but in the in the um, the first chapter, which is the one on abjection, the abject um, strategy, I, I you said you saw abject and archival as points of orientation. Maybe mimetic and precarious are are strategies, but I was I was thinking of them all in a way as as strategies. And you talk about the way in which. Um, there is, uh, in the history of the avant-garde, there are these kind of two um, positions, one of which is uh, transgressive and, uh, and the other of which is, I think you call it, legislative. Um, but you say there's a third option, um, which is to reformulate the vocation, the vocation of the avant-garde, to rethink transgression not as a rupture produced by a heroic avant-garde, posited somehow outside the symbolic order, but as a fracture traced by a strategic avant-garde inside this order. In this view, the goal of the avant-garde is not to break with the symbolic order absolutely, the dream of absolute transgression is dispelled, but to reveal it in crisis, to register its points not only of breakdown, but also of breakthrough that is, to register the points at which new possibilities are opened up by this very crisis. So that idea that the crisis provides an opportunity and that's where art can do something. Um, and it's, a, it's very interesting reading the book when you, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure yet, you get to this point and you say, great, turn the page, what are the examples? And he says, uh, well, most uh, abject art didn't really go in that direction. But there is this amazing, there is this <laughs> amazing footnote. And one recommendation to you is really to read the footnotes almost as a separate uh, essay. They're extraordinary, these footnotes. But it's also fun to read them in order. So you go to the footnote. <laughs> Great. And you get um, something quite remarkable. This is my understanding of Dada, at least in some of its manifestations, which I take up in Chapter 3, Mimetic. So we're going to, I think, want to go to Chapter 3 pretty soon. But uh, radical, oh, sorry, was that? <laughs> <laughs> radical art and theory have often celebrated failed figures, especially deviant masculinities as transgressive of the symbolic order. So thinking about male hysteria and surrealism maybe there. But this avant-gardist logic also assumes, affirms, a stable order against which these figures are opposed. And here's a sentence that's, I think, worthy of uh, comment from you. In my own private Germany, Daniel Paul Schreber's Secret History of Modernity of 1996, Eric Santner, an important point of reference for this book, offers a brilliant rethinking of this logic. He relocates transgression within the symbolic order at a point of internal crisis which he defines as, quote, symbolic authority in a state of emergency. So we have emergency in the title. You make the point, you develop the argument in different ways about this um, role of the avant-garde in, in tracing fractures in the symbolic order. And you going to be taking that in the more recent essays right to the point of that question, what if there are no laws anymore? Which is where I want to go. Uh, but I wondered if you would just say a little bit about um, symbolic authority in a state of emergency and how that helps us to think this yeah, yeah. Um, problem. Yeah, that's a tremendous uh, question, I feel. It's like this is an examination of this uh, live. Well, <laughs> I should know this material, right? I, um, Make something up. <laughs> well, I mean, I, this is, I think, why one writes is that uh, you hope to be read in such a way um, that where you're clarified by, by readers. Um, 
know where, quite where to begin. Uh, I do want to hold on to the idea of the avant-garde. Um, it's a, obviously a dated concept. It can be stripped away from its military uh, beginnings uh, because I think it, it's a term that articulates the, the aesthetic and the political together. And that connection is, um, would be a lot to lose. So um, I do want to hold on to the term, but I also want to think about how contemporary practice, some contemporary practice, uh, makes us rethink the avant-garde, to move away from models that um, I call transgressive, like surrealism, where an order is there to be challenged, mm -hmm. or legislative, like constructivism, where in a moment of revolution, a, a new order can be proposed. Clearly, that's uh, not an, a, a position for an avant-garde in, in our situation, our present. So that's the, this idea of an avant-garde that proceeds imminently, critically, mimetically. Um, and it, it does call up, I mean, I think this is what I've learned, and I'd, I'd like to hear you on this subject too. If you function as a critic and an historian, you tend to go be pulled back and forth. Um, contemporary practice opens up historical questions, historical questions focus contemporary practice for you. So what work like, um, you know, some of the people we've mentioned, Genske and Hirshhorn, others, what they opened up to me was um, an avant-garde, maybe Dadaistic in, mm -hmm. uh, in nature, but not the Dada of Duchamp. I, th I think we've maybe run to the, the limit of the Duchampian genealogy. Um, I think we, we know what that is um, now. Uh, it's, a, it's a different data that these artists call up. And for me, one figure that becomes important more so than Duchamp is Hugo Ball, in that he was the, the head of, of Zurich Dada for a time. Um, and Ball is the one who, in the midst of World War I, in a state of emergency, said, what do artists, what do writers, what do people do in a condition when there seems to be no order. I mean, that's, that's the, the definition of emergency. In the technical sense is laws are suspended. Um, and his answer, this comes from his extraordinary diary of this time called, called Flight Out of Time. Um, this is from 1916 or so. He says, the Dadaist takes on the dissidences of the age to the point of self-disintegration. So it's it's more than mimetic, it's almost um, Christological. And he, he actually did come back to the church, but it's, it's almost this kind of act of sacrifice where you're literally opened up to the present and all its contradictions uh, to the point where you kind of represent it in all its mm -hmm. agony. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's, a, it's obviously a position of enormous risk, it was for him. And, I think it is for artists who take it up in the present. I mean, I think if you know the work, the persona of Isa Genskin, you have an idea what I mean. It's, it's a hazardous project. Um, but that's the, um, that's the avant-garde, that's the data that I think uh, is opened up by this work. And it, it speaks to a time in which um, we are often put in a, at least intermittently, a state of emergency. I mean, quite, quite literally. When uh, I think neoliberalism acts by crisis, by emergency, uh, to deregulate everything it can. Um, but certainly after 9/11 in this country, in the United States, um, we lived in part under uh, emergency. And I'm interested in this book to to think this entire period from 1989, which at one point seemed to be opening to a new world order, you know, the fall of the wall, Tiananmen Square, but now seems to be um, the full emergence of neoliberalism and then the war on terror, um, to, to see how artists and critics have literally come to terms with this condition to anticipate it, to uh, clarify it, to act out against it. 
um, all these things. And sometimes, um, you know, in ways that are not entirely clear. And that's, uh, it's, a, it's a situation that is chaotic. And this is what, when Ball says, you know, what do we do if there, is no, if there are no laws? Um, it's, a, it's a crisis that's um, psychological, social, artistic, political, all at once. And, um, but I think it's, it does speak to some of the, the work that's interested me and some of the politics that have to concern us all. Right. So you, um, in that chapter where you're um, considering the strategy of mimetic exacerbation, the making a bad thing worse um, approach, that and and also in the in the <coughs> chapter on um, the precarious, you really push. You you see these artists as pushing to the point of breakdown. This strategy, and uh, it put me in mind of um, the the kind of in extremist conditions that they're responding to. Um, in some particular ways. One, this idea that uh, we have no laws anymore, which you um, connect very powerfully to the idea of the state of exception and the state of exception becoming, or the state of emergency becoming normative. So it's uh, you know, a condition in which we are um, living um, Daily or intermittently, at least, as as you as you said. Just, just as a, a prince. Yes. Ball is the one who said there are no laws anymore. Uh, in a condition of emergency, which is different from a condition of exception, um, there are new laws. Uh, there are emergency laws. Right. But they suspend or break with laws that were at one point consensual or at least semi-consensual. So these are the nullification. That's yeah, I mean, it. It'd be crazy to say that we live in a present with no laws. Yes. Uh, we live in a present of many, many laws, but they seem more and more arbitrary and more and more invasive. Right. Which is a, a form of chaos of its own. Right. But, well, maybe this... No, 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 no this will be very interesting. This is exactly what I want to talk about in a way, because... Um, one way of maybe describing the, um, the conditions in which we're living in some respects is as a kind of post-legal framework. People talk about that in relation to war crimes and um, abandonment of uh, Geneva Convention. So in that sense, um, uh, living without laws. But as you say, um, nevertheless, under repressive conditions in Britain we've just been witnessing over the past week um, expansion of the um, authoritarian powers. So the question that I suppose I had as I watched these two things coming up against each other in the book was on the one hand following the, the, the fractures in the symbolic order and on the other hand the, the symbolic order so uh, in a sense, already destroyed in its own terms. And trying to think about how that also registers um, psychically and the ways in which the artists are, are exploring that contradiction. Right, I mean, that, that takes us back to um, this account of Judge Schraper by my friend Eric Sandner. Schraper was, um, maybe the most famous paranoiac of all time. He was not a patient of Freud, but uh, Freud developed his idea of paranoia in relation to his memoir, Schreber memoir. And just very quickly, um, Schreber was a, a jurist, um, extraordinary figure, extraordinary family, but he was a jurist who was about to be appointed, not to the Supreme Court of Germany, but it would be the equivalent of a superior court within a province, I mean, a high, uh, judicial office, and at, just at that point, he he breaks down, totally, gloriously, radically, and thinks that you know God is in love with him, and God has sex with him, and you know it's wild. Um, 
I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not even well. I could go on. Um, but Sandner understands this breakdown to be more or less this. Um, and I, you know, think about this in, in terms of your moments of, Sandner calls it symbolic investiture, when, it, when a, an agency or an institution says, you are, you are the right person for the job. Schreber, this is how Sandner views the breakdown. Schreber um, thought, well, if this, if the if court wants me, if the law wants me to represent it, how fucked up is it? How it just, it's entirely smoke and mirrors. Um, and there's, I think there's a profound logic of the institution here. Um, I mean, I know when, I mean, it's, the other great theorist of this moment is Groucho Marx, you know, why would I want to be a member of a club that wants mm -hmm. me as a member? Uh, <laughs> that, you know, that's the, the crisis of symbolic vestiture, you know, that we all project um, a symbolic order, it has real effects on us. Mm -hmm. It's not that there are no laws, but it is a, you know, it's a consensual hallucination in a way too, that we should be um, determined, um, that we should be defined in the ways that we think we are. And um, I think in moments of a political crisis, that comes into, you know, into appearance uh, in ways that are not necessarily psychotic, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, that uh, one can begin to see where the limits are, where the cracks are. And it's there that an avant-garde, again, of, of imminent critique would be positioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, this sounds maybe more theoretical than it is, but... Um, well, maybe, um, I don't know, maybe talking about some of the examples from the book would make that clearer. The um, the other place that you you talk about Santner's work is you talk about this idea of the creaturely, and I wonder if you might want to say something about that. Yeah. Um, vis a vis Hirschhorn, the the or collages of the Iraq War, because that's a place where you kind of get this idea of schism between uh, law mm -hmm. and um, authority. Yeah. This. Uh, this is a notion that I want to explore in, the, in my next project. But um, mm -hmm. basically, the idea is that when we are in situations in which power seems to bear on us um, almost directly, almost obscenely, that we cringe before it. And, and we lose, um, in part, what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. um, we become creaturely, in effect. Mm -hmm. and Hirschhorn, I think, in, in some of his work, is interested to take on that position and to um, push back from it. So he has um, pushed back on power from that position. So he, he uses terms like the bet, like the stupid. You know, what would it be to make work out of, uh, you know, a position that one could call bet? What would it mean to do work that was kopflos, headless? Um, not not reasoned in the usual way. Um, what would it be to make work out of um, you know real passion that might be human, might not be human? Um, you know, so he wants to tap into the the kind of affect of of the fan, say. Um, you know, again, I think these are dangerous ploys, but. Um, I think they're, you know, they're called out by the, by the present. And there's there's one thing I, just on this note that I wanted to, to stress, and I, because I, I think it's um, difficult for me in the book, and I think difficult for others too. And that um, this idea of mimetic exacerbation, it, it I, I associate it with a. Um, a difficult term in Walter Benjamin, this term uh, positive barbarism. Um, 
And, you know, Benjamin says more than once um, that um, we have to think about ways to survive culture, to outlive culture, if need be. And he thinks that there's a, uh, an aspect of modernism which teaches us how to survive in this way. Um, it's a particular idea of modernism that he has, but this, this notion of a positive barbarism that he, he develops in the 1930s, just at the moment of fascism and Nazism, it was extraordinary to want to revalue barbarism at that mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. I, I think that also speaks to some of the, the artists that concern me, and it, it can be a nihilistic position, but I want to support it, because I, I do think there's a real critical force there. But it's, it's often very difficult to distinguish this positive barbarism of artists like Genske and Hirshhorn and others um, from the capitalist nihilism of artists like Jeff Koons or, and Damien Hirst. And, um, you know, which I don't mean to condemn totally. I think uh, at moments, at times, they also have very important things to say. But I, you know, in a way it's a one, one line that I attempt to draw is a very fine line in this book between um, a positive nihilism and a, a nihilism that um, is only nihilistic. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I can make it any more clear. It's still um, not entirely clear to me, but I, I think this is what a critic is forced to do um, in, in the present, to, to make the distinctions that one, he or she can, um, and to, you know, make, kind of make these calls, mm. and see if there's, you know, there, there are notions, there are concepts, or at least terms that can be developed to make them clear. Yeah. Uh, I want, in just a moment, to, to get to your questions, because there are a lot of you here, and I imagine many of you have already had the opportunity to read this book and have questions about it. But I'll just close my part by asking you to um, say a little bit more about actuality. You read from the, um, uh, the coda of the book, or the the diatribe or whatever it is. But the term actuality um, I found very interesting in a political sense in this um, investigation at the end of the book. We're very familiar um, with the term contemporary and trying to kind of um, make that work in, in one way or another. But actuality is something very different and you pose it really as a political tense or at least that's how I took it. And I also took it um, kind of psychoanalytically. I took a few things in this book psychoanalytically um, without necessarily, yeah, right, and not necessarily with the permission of the author. But it was in this sense, um, which is that um, one of the things that that theory is about is trying to kind of encourage us into the present and um, to consider the ways in which um, we may uh, rush into the past and, and dread the future rather than um, considering um, ourselves in the present. And, and some of those tendencies seem to be um, also manifested in study of the contemporary, which is something that you point out in some of the uh, paragraphs of the of the coda that you read. So for me, I found this very uh, powerful as a proposition about um, artistic um, possibilities for the present in, as an engagement with politics and this idea that the avant-garde is alive and well. Um, and I just wondered if you would say a little bit about how you came to this term, actuality. Sure. Maybe it's back on. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, I, I think that's um, that's certainly how the book ends. So it'd be good to conclude there too. Um, I I do mean it 
as other, this term actuality, as, as other than contemporary. Because I think uh, as a field, um, contemporary, contemporary art seems to mean only the present. Um, and it's this, if you're a contemporary art historian, which is somewhat oxymoronic, you're asked to be everywhere all at once at the same time, which is right now. Um, it's an impossible thing. But I also mean it as different from the, the demand for liveness, for presence that um, the museum more and more seems to uh, want to promote in order to be relevant to the rest of a culture that so celebrates um, the commodity of presence, of liveness, which I think finally has to do with um, the way the, the economy asks us to actualize all the time, um, not only to consume, but to produce, I mean, to uh, be an, a new form of human capital every year, every month, every moment. Um, and I, this is why I still hold on, or I've come back to the idea of the artwork, the art museum, the institution of art as a place that can constellate different moments, different orders, um, different cultures, different times of subjectivity and sociality, that there um, you can have a sense of actuality because the work, the institution allows for, um, and Benjamin would call it a dialectical image, but a, a, a moment, a space where um, different orders of experience can come together in a register that's aesthetic, cognitive, um, and maybe political. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it may be a utopian term, but um, I think people experience it quite regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's why they're drawn, uh, and I don't think this is just an elitist view, uh, to the work of art, to the museum of art. They don't necessarily want to go there to hear Bjork. Um, they can get that elsewhere. They, they want to be um, tested in other ways, and I think that, you know, that's an important function still for uh, for art and its institutions. So, anyway. Thank you. Um, we have some time now for your questions, and I think there is a, a microphone going around. So, there's someone here. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, really look forward to reading the book. Um, I haven't yet, so if this question is off base, then you can correct me. Um, but I was wondering how far you take the, uh, the practices surrounding this idea of emergency um, in terms of the, I'm thinking of the temporality of the critic that you were talking about, this kind of strange historian slash critic needing to go back and forth all the time. And I was then thinking about in terms of emergency, this idea of like triage, like that you have to choose the thing that's the least dead in a way, mm -hmm. and how that might fit into the points you made earlier. Also, informed by, as I'm sure you are, the, the important debates in liveness, uh, the d important debates about liveness and performance studies from people like Peggy <laughs> Phelan and Rebecca Schneider, and how that fits into all of this. It, I guess my question that is making less sense is, is about the kind of practices of the critic and the, what, that, what the temporalities of that are. Thanks very much. Yeah, I mean, it, um, that's a tough one uh, because I'm not up on the status of Leibniz and performance studies. Um, but I, I have thought about emergency, and it, they're, they're, it can be its own um, fetish term, too. I think often uh, Hirshhorn um, uses it to kind of make excitement. You know, it, it has its own uh, its own charisma, which I think is somewhat dangerous. But um, I don't think about it so much uh, as the critic who operates in emergency. I, I, um, 
you know, my point about the, the way in which many of us, or at least some of us, work as both critics and historians is um, that's not so much in the, the order of emergency, it's in the order of urgency that what um, enlivens a historical project is if there's a contemporary commitment. And what focuses a contemporary commitment or clarifies it is, uh, you know, his, uh, historical sense. So that's why that, you know, I think I learned this from um, very different figures in the generation ahead of us um, who are somehow able to uh, sharpen the one with the other all the time. And, uh, but that, that's really about urgency more than emergency. Um, you know, my interest in emergency stems from this desire to rethink the avant-garde at, at times, uh, again, quite literally of emergency, to think, you know, what, what it does, um, you know, what it, in conditions, uh, say, after World War II, which is where I'll go next, uh, after World War I, when there's a prolonged state of emergency. Um, but I, f I think in a way I've failed your, your question. So I'll get back to you. <laughs> or maybe you can get back to me. <laughs> Tell me what to think about these things. Thanks. Hi, I just um, wanted to ask you if you could speak a little bit more about the post-critical. Mm -hmm. um, specifically in relation to, I mean, I totally identify with what you say about Latour. But, um, but so I'm interested in this kind of Ranciarian perspective because it seems to me that a lot of Ranciere's work is <coughs> read as like really kind of or used as being like over positive. It's often used to kind of explain away what art can do at a moment of crisis. Um, one of the figures that doesn't do that is Claire Bishop. Um, but I think that that kind of she kind of like usurps. His, what I think is his cynicism for her own, <laughs> actually, and you know, engages with him in with with a slightly different agenda. So, yeah. my question is about the post uh, post critical, specifically with bearing in mind, is there a potential to read Ron Sierra as being a lot more cynical than he's actually being dealt with in art criticism recently? Yes. <laughs> uh, no, I. I, I I totally agree with you. Look, I, I have um, enormous respect for Rancière and Latour, but they have promoted in different ways um, uh, an idea that somehow we need to go beyond critique, that we are beyond critique. Um, and I, I, I get the, the frustration with criticality as a reified value in its own right. I mean, my generation of artists and critics really, you know, made that perhaps too automatic a good. Um, but the, you know, so my, my problem with Rossier, it's, and it's not his historical work, it's really his work on art, is, is twofold. On the one hand, he uh, imagines that, that art can do much more than it can. Um, his famous phrase there is the, the distribution of the redistribution of the sensible. Um, so in a way, it's a it's a wish factory. It's a uh, and I've seen it operate on young artists. They think, wow, I can really have this effectivity on the the order of the senses. Um, you know, there are many many other um, agents, institutions with far more effect on the distribution of the sensible than little old contemporary art, even though it's a big branch of the culture industry. So I'd, there he's, he's way too romantic for me. Elsewhere he's way too cynical, because he, he, he seems to see criticism as only cynicism. That what critical art does what is simply um, replay uh, the, the, the Duchampian position that everything is a commodity, everything is a spectacle. Um, I actually think that there real, there's real potential in cynicism. I mean, this is where a figure like Paulo Virno interests me because he, 
he says, even cynical reason, even cynical knowledge has reason, has knowledge. Um, it's just what one does with it. Um, so on the one hand, Rensselaer is too romantic. On the other hand, too cynical for me. Latour is different. He, he, he feels that criticism is simply too iconoclastic, um, that it um, kind of acts out um, an authority, a power uh, that we should be very skeptical about. And that too I understand totally, but I, I think we, we still live in a world that needs demystification, that still needs deconstruction, uh, that we can't simply give up on these tools, these weapons. Um, and I, I think we have fetishes enough that need to be um, unmasked, even destroyed. So I'm, you know, I, but I also understand the, the, the discontent around old critical postures. Um, but rather than be, to be ditched, I just think they need to be reworked. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's why the post-critical chapter has a question mark. So I don't want to offer it up as a term. I want to um, question it. Hi there. Uh, just going back, well, maybe an extension to Rancia, going back to what you're talking about, performative practices. And also you quickly mentioned um, democratic communities within sort of that structure. And um, I, my observation really, you know, in a way that the institutions, our institutions, our practices to some extent, uh, kind of turn that, in my own observation, almost into something that's like a militant democracy, more so than a kind of a democratic community. It kind of through funding, through sort of selectivity, through programming, through even the architecture of the space, the gray space you're perhaps talking about, it almost became quite sort of exclusive in its own right. So, you know, I don't know if there's a sort of emerging question there somewhere. What are your observations on that in, in relationship to mm -hmm. that democratic community? That's, that really interests me. I mean, I'd, I, I wish you would say more. Um, or maybe, again, you can email me the, the right answer. Uh, so I hadn't really thought about it in these, this, this way. Um, but I think you're on to an important insight. Um, I mean, just in this last period of time, what I've felt in museums um, are, are two dominant tendencies. One is, and this has to do in part with the embrace of relational aesthetics within the museum, which is also to do with performance and process as well. It's almost as if um, the museum is one of the last default spaces where relationality can happen at all. I mean, there's, you know, it's one of the last remnants of public sphere, maybe like the library, maybe like primary school, where everything else that's cut, that's deregulated, is, is put there. And, so it has this kind of weird um, quality of, of the compensatory that maybe still in art spaces we can get together and relate somehow. That's one that you know, I felt over the, the last period of time. And the other is, is, as you say, through architecture. I haven't felt the, the militant aspect, but I think that that's there. Through the architecture especially, um, Museums have attempted to recreate a, uh, an immersive experience, um, a, even a sublime experience that we, we all, we get to all too often elsewhere in the culture. Um, you know, one of excitement, intensity, uh, about what, who knows really, <laughs> as long as th that affect is there. Um, that, that's what I felt, those two things I felt in, in modern and contemporary art museums over the last couple of decades. But I'll, I'll be on the, the alert for this milit militant dimension. I, I'm paranoid, paranoid enough to believe that that's there too. <laughs> There's one question there. 
So I wanted to return to the concept of the creaturely, and particularly as it's related to possibly tracing out fractures within the symbolic order. And I'm wondering if you see a relationship there or a power within the notion of the creaturely in terms of distinguishing between actuality and um, activation or liveness as a kind of end goal, and seeing that almost as another kind of fracture. Wow. Um. I wish I, had, <laughs> I wish I had written that. Uh, <laughs> even there should be a, an addendum. Um, chapter six. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but I, I do think it's difficult to think this condition in which one is in the full spotlight of power, you know, which is really quite obscene. This is what we now understand as the creaturely or, you know, it's, it's very related to bare life, which, you know, is another concept in Bendy Me and Gompen and others. Um, how that can be turned around, activated somehow. Um, I think that is what, um, what Hirshhorn attempts to do. And my next project it's really central because what I want to do in the post-war is think about why different artists and thinkers turn to the the brutal. You know, why does Dubuffet become interested in art brut? Why does Bataille become interested in the paintings of animals in the caves? Um, why does Asger Jorn kind of take on the creaturely? I mean, why are there movements like Cobra that identify with this condition of the human animal? Um, it is about an actuality in the sense that I think it's pressured by, um, you know, again, moments when there seems to be no given order. Or in that moment, after the war, after the Holocaust, after the bomb, when, you know, there seemed to be no, no possibility of life even, um, but it, you know, it, it bears on, on new brutalism too. I mean, the whole idea of the as found, um, with the Smithsons and Pelosi and others. So, that's exactly where I want to go. But I, I'm not really clear on it yet. But you, you actually helped me think about it. So thanks. <laughs> for your return. So thank you very much, um, audience, for coming out today. And let's thank Hal for his work and for his talk today.